Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight for the Calvert Peace Projects event in our Peaceful Speaker Series. And for those of you who are tuning in from other parts of the United States, Calvert County is located in Southern Maryland. I will share a bit about the Calvert Peace Projects before we begin. Um, Sherry, can you please advance to the next slide? So it's the first peace project established by Peace Through Action, which is a national peace building organization. I am the program manager. My name is Jessica Harding and our project's mission, as well as our key activities are all listed there on the screen. I will point out that we are in the recruitment process for the Peaceful Leaders Youth Program, which will be a one week summer experience for high school aged youth from July 18th to the 23rd. So if you wanna learn more about that, please visit our website or contact me directly. Also our Peaceful Readers Book Club meets once per month and our next book will be Bridge Builders, bringing people together in a polarized age. So you can sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date with our upcoming events. We have about two or three per month. Okay, so that's enough about the project for now. And we'll go back to our focus, which is the programming for tonight. And like I mentioned before, this is a peaceful speakers event. Our guest trainer is Sherry Tardio from the Community Mediation Center of Calvert County. She has been a mediator since 2012 and has been the executive director of the center since 2018. So I will now pass the microphone to Sherry. Thank you, Jessica. So um, just to quickly go over some of the goals for this evening's session, we're going to be talking uh, about reflective listening and then doing some actual practice. So you can uh, get a feel for what it's like when you're actually doing it. We'll be talking about facilitation, uh, the facilitator's role, some skills that facilitators might find useful in facilitating community conversations. Uh, we'll be talking about um, what kind of guidelines you might want to set if you're a facilitator and you're uh, involved in a community conversation. Talking about how to set the appropriate tone and things that can help and also can hurt a conversation. Uh, then Jessica is going to tell you all a little bit about a program called Living Room Conversations. And then hopefully we'll have some time to talk about uh, how to respond to challenging situations as a facilitator and what you might do. And then we'll go over some of our upcoming events. Um, I would love this presentation to be interactive. So if you have questions, please you know, go ahead and shout them out or um, put them in the chat. Jessica, can you see the chat? Yes. Okay, great. Because when I'm sharing the slides, I can't see very much. So um, Jessica can monitor the chat so you can put questions there or just feel free to, to shout out with comments or questions. Uh, I'd like this to be real informal. Okay, so we're going to start with um, reflective listening. And as a mediator, I would say reflective listening is probably the most important skill that we do in mediation sessions. Um, and it's something that can be used not only in things like mediation and facilitation, but it's something that can be really helpful in your everyday life, in your workplace, with families, with neighbors, with your kids, your spouse. Um, it's just a really useful skill to have. And it can both prevent conflict and decrease conflict and also helps to build relationships. So um, some of the main points about reflective listening are that it really shows that you, the listener, are there for the speaker. You're in the moment, you're present, and you're really tuned in to what that speaker is saying. And although that seems pretty obvious, um, I, I wanna really emphasize that because a lot of times when we think we're listening, what we're really doing is waiting for our turn to talk. And we're not really listening deeply to what the person is saying. So for reflective listening, it's really about being present and listening deeply um, before you say anything. Um, it's just really being there to help the speaker understood, understand that you're trying to follow along with them. What you actually do in reflective listening is pretty simple. What you're doing is repeating back or reflecting the important points that you heard the speaker say. 
um, and you're using their own words to reflect that back to them. Now, some people can say, isn't that just like parroting somebody? Doesn't it seem stiff? And at first it, it can, um, but the more you do it, the more you can sort of make it your own. It seems like a more natural thing to do. And um, rather than just parroting back everything that the person says, what you're really doing is listening for the important points and also the feelings that the speaker is either expressing verbally or showing physically. So you're really paying attention, not just to the, the verbiage, but also to facial expressions, body expressions, and you're really keying in to what that person is saying and feeling, and then you're giving that back to them. So what that does is it allows speakers to, number one, feel like they're actually being heard, um, which is a pretty rare thing in today's society to actually feel like somebody is listening deeply to you and is really trying to understand where you're coming from rather than just reactively responding to it. Um, it also allows the speaker to hear their own words. Sometimes when, especially when we're in conflict or when we're very emotional, we don't necessarily um, pause to think about the words we're using. So sometimes we may say things that we don't really mean or that aren't really accurate. So in reflecting things back, it allows the speaker to actually hear for themselves what they said, how they came across. And then they can correct any misunderstandings or clarify what they really meant. So it, it, it helps the speaker not only feel heard, but also to get clarity on what it is that they really want to say. So um, just a little quote here for this one. When people feel they're being heard, they're more able to hear the other's point of view. As we hear ourselves and each other, we gain clarity on what is important to us and to the other person. We are then more likely to be able to work together to resolve conflict. So as I said, that's really the basis of the work that we do as transformative mediators at our mediation center in Calvert. It's really about helping people to express themselves and also helping them to hear the other person. So some of the um, important things about reflective listening, and we use this in our training. Um, so a little thing we call listen, listen like a dog. I don't know if any of you have pets. You could substitute your personal pet, you know, listen like a guinea pig, listen if you're on a farm, listen like a cow, I've heard. Um, but if, you, if you've had a dog and you can see in that picture, when you're talking to them, they are just focused on you. And it really at least appears like um, that they're really listening and they're really attending to you. So when you're listening like a dog, you're listening to the speaker, number one, without interrupting them, number two, without judging them. This is a, an important one, number three, you're listening without giving advice. Oftentimes when people are telling us about an issue they have or a problem they have, and this comes from a good place, we want to give them advice because we want to help. That's a natural thing. However, I'm you know, if you've ever experienced when you're just trying to tell somebody something or you're emotional and they, before you can even finish talking about what you're saying, they're giving you all kinds of advice about what you should do. Sometimes it's not perceived as particularly helpful. Um, it's one thing if somebody says, hey, I'd like your advice about this situation. But if they don't, if you're just doing reflective listening, you want to really try and tame that tendency to jump in with advice unless it's asked for. So that goes along with, you know, not trying to fix the problem for them. Um, one of the things that reflective listening can do, as I said, is help people get clarity on how they're feeling, what their values are, what their, the decisions that are available to them are. And they can actually, by being listened to, can start to feel strong enough to make a decision for themselves about how they wanna handle whatever it is. So by jumping in quickly to give advice or to fix the problem, you're not really allowing that person to handle it themselves. So we encourage people to hold off on that unless it's asked for. Same thing with offering an opinion. 
um, unless somebody asks for your opinion. Another thing that can be really difficult is um, not asking too many questions. So when we're doing reflective listening, we're really there again to, to be like a mirror, to hold up to that person what they've said. So we're following their story. We're following what they want to say, rather than us determining what are the important things we need to find out. So if we're going searching for information and asking a lot of questions, that's sort of taking that person off of what they thought was important to talk about and focusing on to what we think is important to find out about. So we wanna try not to ask too many questions. And lastly, we don't wanna steal the other person's story. And I'm sure you've experienced this. Um, it's when somebody starts to tell you something that happened to them, or you start to tell somebody and then they try and one up you. So, oh my God, I slept horribly last night. Oh, well, I've got an infant in my house and I haven't slept well since they were born. Let me tell you. And then they're off and running and they've stolen your story. So, and again, it's, it's a natural human instinct. It's the way we try to connect, right? We try to find things we have in common with other people. However, if we're purposely trying to listen reflectively, we're not going to jump in with our own stories. We're not going to steal the story from that person because we want them to be able to finish telling it in their way and then hear it back. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so any questions so far about reflective listening? No? All right, so um, I thought I'd give you an example um, and then maybe um, throw, throw something out there to see if you all can come up with what you might say as a reflective listener. So for example, if somebody came up to me um, and said to me, oh, Sherry, work is really stressing me out. I just don't know if I can take it anymore. There are several ways I could respond, okay? So one way I could respond is to say, oh yeah, me too, oh my God, my boss is horrible. Let me tell you what he did today, right? That's stealing the story, mm. okay? So that's not reflective listening. I could say, well, if it's stressing you out too much, why don't you just quit? That's also not reflective listening. That's giving advice or maybe an opinion, trying to fix the problem, okay? Or I could say something like, you know, we're all stressed out between COVID and the economy. It's hard for everyone. That may be true. Um, and it may be normalizing what that person is feeling, but it's also not reflective listening. Okay. So that's another thing. You don't want to just try and normalize what that person is telling you because their experience is unique to them. Uh, and you don't want to minimize that. So if somebody came to me and said, Sherry, work is really stressing me out. I don't know if I can take it anymore. Something I might say that would be a demonstration of reflective listening is, wow, you are so stressed by, my, by your work. You just don't even know if you can take it. Okay? I'm giving them back their own words. And what that does is, if, if I've heard it correctly, what you'll usually get is a, yeah, and, and they'll keep going. If you get it wrong, they'll correct you and then they'll keep going. So either way, it's okay. Um, that's another thing that's great about reflective listening. If you get it right, it's great. If you get it wrong, it's still great because the person will correct you. And in correcting you, that helps them to clarify what they're saying and to say it in a way that people can understand it better. So you really can't go wrong. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to give, give you all a statement and see if somebody can come up with what you might say as a reflective listener, okay? So if somebody comes up to you and says, my kids are driving me crazy, the house is a mess and they never help. What could you possibly say as a reflection back to them? Any brave volunteers? Boy, I can respond to that. <laughs> okay, what would you say? I've been there. We've got four of them. And when they're all wanting something uh, differently all at the same time, it's a little bit stressful. Okay. 
So yeah, so you could say something like, I've been there, I've got four kids, but is that repeating back what they've told you? No, it's not. Not really. So while it is, you're trying to build a relationship, you're trying to tell them you get it, what could you say that would really just like be a mirror and reflect back to them what they said? Anybody? Lisa shared in the chat, that's a lot. Please tell me more. Okay, so <laughs> you could do that. You could ask a question. Please tell me more is sort of like a question. And But before you even did that, what would a good <laughs> reflection be? And I'll say it again. So my kids are driving me crazy. The house is a mess and they never help. Well, I, I would naturally, without using your, what you're teaching, <clears throat> I would say, sounds like you're really frustrated. Mm -hmm. that's, that's my natural response. Mm -hmm. And you know what? The way I was saying that, they didn't use the word frustrated, but you picked up on the tone of voice. Maybe you picked up on the facial expression. That uh -huh. would be fine. So what you were reflecting was not their words, but you were reflecting their tone or their behavior. Their feeling. Then, yeah. yeah, their feeling. That's, okay. totally, that's totally fine. Yeah, so, I've, I've yeah. had people um, repeat to me what I said, and it, it seems stilted to me. It can feel stilted, especially when you're, you're just learning it or, you know, you're leaving out the feeling part of it. Okay. So, you know, it, you know, but the more you do it, the more natural it becomes. And so I could go, yeah, gosh, I'm really frustrated. Or I could go, no, I'm not really frustrated. I'm mad. Okay. Uh, you know, so either way, I'm clarifying what I said, and it's encouraging me to say more. Okay. So that's the idea. So you're, you're reflecting back what they say, and then also any associated emotions that, you know, you might sense in their tone or in their behavior. Okay. All right. So I've got this fun little video. Uh, to demonstrate a little bit about reflective listening. It's just, there's all this pressure, you know? And sometimes it feels like it's right up on me and I can just feel it, like literally feel it in my head and it's relentless. And I don't know if it's gonna stop. I mean, that's the thing that scares me the most is that I don't know if it's ever gonna stop. Yeah. Well, you do have a nail in your head. It is not about the nail. Are you sure? Because, I mean, I'll bet if we got that out of there. Stop would... trying to fix it. No, I'm not trying to fix it. I'm just pointing out that maybe the nail is causing- You always do this. You always try to fix things when what I really need is for you to just listen. No, see, I don't think that is what you need. I think what you need is to get the nail See, out. you're not even listening now. Okay, fine. I will listen. Fine. It's just... Sometimes it's like... There's this achy... I don't know what it is. And I'm not sleeping very well at all. And all my sweaters are snagged. I mean, all of them. That sounds really hard. It is. Thank you. Ow! Oh, come on! Ow. If you would just don't try to see things, my. I love that video. <laughs> okay, so um, what we'd like to to give you all a chance to do now is uh, to do a little reflective listening practice with each other. So um, Jessica is going to put you in some breakout rooms in a minute. And what, you're, what you wanna focus on, and I'll talk about um, what the actual exercise is on the next slide. But what you wanna make sure is as much as possible on Zoom, we wanna try and maintain eye contact. We wanna look interested, be interested, right? So we really want to be present, be deeply listening to what your partner is saying, be aware of what's said, be aware of what's not said, 
And that can be, you know, maybe not what they're saying, but their tone of voice, their facial expression. And, you know, if um, somebody had said something about, tell me more about that, you can use, use something like that to uh, draw out some more of the story from them, but you don't wanna ask a whole lot of detail questions. Okay, you wanna follow rather than lead in the conversation when you're being the reflective listener. So what you're going to do is break into groups and your prompt is going to be a goal that I'm working on and some things that I'm doing to achieve it. So we're going to have partner A speak for two minutes while partner B listens. And then partner B is going to reflect back to partner A what they heard. So you're going to reflect back the main points of what you heard and then perhaps any emotions that you heard, um, anything else that you think is relevant. And then partner A can give you some feedback on whether you got that correct, whether there was something you missed, anything like that. And then you're going to switch roles. Okay, so everybody sort of following along with what they're going to be doing. So Jessica, I'm not sure how you want to work it with people where there are two of them on one Zoom screen. <laughs> yeah, in that case, I guess they can share together and then everyone else will be will go into a, a room. So I have the breakout rooms all set. Are we good to go? Okay, and how long are we going to have total for this exercise? So I've given 10 minutes, so people can, they'll have eight minutes for the actual activity, but they'll have like a minute to settle in, choose who's partner A, who's partner B, and yeah, they'll figure that out. Okay. So, so nice. 10 minutes. Okay, sounds great. Okay, and the instructions are in your chat box, so you can return to them. And I'll open the rooms now. So welcome back. Um, we're going to take a little time to debrief what just happened. So I'm curious, what did you notice about yourself during your experience being the speaker? Was two minutes too long, too short? What was your experience? Feel free to come off mute. It was too short for me. I It was Not awkward. Too long for you. No, it was too short. Oh yeah, I couldn't talk long enough. So it the time frame was too long. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. And it's easy for me. I can talk for a long time about <laughs> nothing. So. Yeah, it really depends on the person. I, I became a bit of a not a strain, you know, but I thought because I don't talk a lot. <laughs> so it was like and I wasn't just trying to fill air and I was really trying to be truthful and and what I have been experiencing and I wanted to convey that to Bob you know who I thought was a very very uh kind listener you know mm. very receptive I thought thank you yeah well I found that Sandra and I were so well suited it was <laughs> like the unicorns were in alignment tonight oh. um and so so one story really mirrored the other and morphed into a not I can relate can I tell you my story but I can relate let's compare notes and so um we, I I felt like we really hit the jackpot so oh, thanks I love when that happens <laughs> yeah, it was yeah great. I, I felt like I got I received more as a listener than I did as the speaker you know it was the listening was good for me Okay. Because it helped me not feel alone. Oh. You know, I, she was echoing a lot of my feelings. That was great. Beautiful. What did other others notice about your experience being a being a listener? Um, I thought I was listening very carefully because he was giving me a lot of information, and. Mm -hmm. I thought I I have to re I have to remember this you know really pay attention yeah. and I wanted to really not give advice I was trying to remember the points don't give advice you know just listen and um, don't steal the story don't judge and I just wanted to be just open and listening to him you know and I and when I did say I really basically I I, I applaud you and I, I hear your frustration you know um 
and then I was a little aware of am I hitting am I stepping onto a point that I shouldn't be stepping on you know so I was kind of conscious of that but I really try to listen very carefully and not not to fill in from my own head and just listen to the information that was being given to me and the way it was being given to me yeah, that's something we do a lot, isn't it? We sort of jump ahead and, and fill in things in our in our own minds. So yeah, absolutely. You were aware of, of your tendency to maybe try to do that and you were able to stop. So that's that's fantastic. I think that what I what I found was it's it's difficult to be the speaker when you're doing an exercise like that because you're you feel like you're on time and you have to fill it. But it's so it's, but it's easier to be the active listener in a setting like that because you know, okay, I have to listen for these two minutes. I have to be able to repeat back and make the person feel as though I, I heard them. So it's, so as a breakout, it's probably easier as an active listener, whereas using these tools in just everyday scenarios it, with your spouse or at work, it, it would be much more challenging to be the active listener. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I kind of related to what you were saying, Terry, as uh, Patricia and I, we were in a room together and I felt like we were on the same page because we really had a strong desire to practice these skills uh, because of our, our passion to communicate better with others. And Patricia, I felt that you really listened well to what I had to share and gave me really clear and concise feedback that was very, very helpful. So thank you. All right, so I, any, I felt, oh, please share. I, I just, this is Pat. I, uh, I don't know if I'm showing through there or not. I've got a, you know, a little ball of a head and shoulders here. <laughs> showing them. It's um, we. I I think that we uh, did well in communicating our own issues, and were able to reflect them back. Uh, and I think it was helpful because they were very similar in in uh, what we were attempting to, you know, what we were practicing and what we were, were wanting to do, and what. Nice. So it sounds like we have a lot of very good listeners in this group. Um, did anyone find the reflective piece challenging, like having to actually like restate what people had said? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was funny because Patricia, if you recall, you were saying that, um, if you don't mind me sharing, one of the things is that uh, it's difficult to listen to, to interact with people when they go off on a tangent. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, you can, and then I was hearing others like Megan and uh, knowing what, how to utilize that time. Are you going too long with that and not wanting to get in the way by asking a question that really becomes more about yourself to help the person to move along <laughs> and being able to listen in a way where, oh my gosh, am I gonna remember this? And so I really mm -hmm. felt like, and this can't happen all the time, but mm -hmm. I felt like I need a notepad. Right? <laughs> yeah. My short term yeah. memory, right? For whatever exactly. reason, may not, because I wanna kind of capture everything, but that's not really um, the point of it. I need to parrot back everything that was said. So again, try to get out of my own head, let go and listen and relax and not, uh, you know, make it harder than what the exercise is supposed to be about. So yeah, it could be a little challenging. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really good point, Willetta. It's great to see you, by the way. <laughs> um, I, I think sometimes when we're trying to do the reflective listening, we do get so caught up in, I have to remember all the details of what they said. Um, I know when I was going through my mediator training, especially um, because sometimes we're dealing with court cases or 
things like that. People are throwing around numbers for money or things, you know, health repairs, and I'm not even sure what they're talking about. And I start getting in my own head about, oh my God, I, I don't even know what that word means. Or I don't, I, you know, I've, I've lost track of all these numbers they've thrown around. And, um, and so that can happen too, is we're so worried about being able to listen well that we're not listening. <laughs> So it, um, as Loletta said, you know, it's, it's really important then to, you know, bring yourself back again to the present moment and what is this person saying right now and not getting all in your own head about, am I going to remember everything? Because remember, the point is not to parrot back word for word what they said. It was to convey that you understood the main points or the main emotions something like that. And, you know, um, one of the things that I learned through my mediation practice is if you miss something that's really important, the person's going to come back and say it again. And if you miss it that time, they're going to say it a third time. And they're going <laughs> to keep saying it until you acknowledge that you heard it. <laughs> so, you know, if something's really important, it will come back if you're being a receptive mm -hmm. listener. So you really don't, again, you don't have to worry about missing things as long as you're really being present in the moment and trying to just focus on what the person's saying. Thank you. Okay, the last question I have for you, how can the skill of reflective listening help you in your relationships moving forward? Could you repeat that? Yeah, how can the skill of reflective listening help you in your relationships moving forward? I'll share. <laughs> Great. Um, I think for me, the challenge is always with those that are closer to me, like my husband or my kids, because of the, the role dynamics, I'm assuming, especially as a, as a mother, um, I find myself talking in my head, shut up, Waletta, shut up, <laughs> and listening, <laughs> because it's just that dynamic, you just feel kind of safe with those that are close with you to kind of, for whatever reason, maybe shut them down, no right, no wrong to it. Um, compared to if, if it's someone that is, you know, maybe out in the community, I have a tendency to really focus and concentrate on that conversation. So um, thank you for that reminder and that question, because I'm going to practice more <laughs> with my loved ones. <laughs> thank you. Yes, Terry. I was a guidance counselor, and so I was trained by adolescents in how to listen reflectively. Otherwise, they wouldn't talk to me. Um, yes. And they, they they taught me a lesson with my own son that I'll share only because it was kind of life changing. And now I have no family drama. So I feel like it was miraculous. But the problem was that I told my son every time that the dishwasher needed to be unloaded, that I expected it to be done before I got home from work. And he has like two hours. And consistently, it never, ever happened. And I was at my wit's end because we had a good relationship and it just seemed so oppositional. And I was venting at work because I'm a counselor. <laughs> and they're like, well, so why doesn't he do this? I'm like, what? I'm like, why? <laughs> I, I didn't ask him why I told him. So anyway, um, the next time the opportunity arose, I said, Kevin, listen, just to make sure we're on the same page. The reason I need the dishwasher emptied when I get home from work is because I like to fix dinner and do the dirty dishes in one step. If I have to fix dinner and then go put my feet up while you unload the dishwasher so then I can go back and do, it, it makes my night so long. And Kevin looked at me in astonishment. He goes, oh, that's totally reasonable. I thought you were just being a control freak. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I learned that if he, if I just explained to him, here's why I need it done, you know, by four, so that he was like, yeah, fine, I get that, no problem. <laughs> Who knew? 
Who knew? Yeah. And so reflective listening is life changing. That's why I'm here to, to cheer. <laughs> it is life changing. Thank you for letting me share that. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. And thank you everyone for sharing. Um, I'm going to pass the microphone now back to Sherry for the next section on facilitation. All righty, let me share my screen again. Okay, can everybody see the screen again? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, great. All right, so um, now that we've talked about the skill of reflective listening, I wanna move a little bit into the facilitator's role. So this is something that, you know, you may find yourself in this role in the future, or maybe you're interested in exploring it. Um, being somebody who can not just be a reflective listener one-on-one, -on -one, but actually facilitate some sort of group conversation, a community conversation, um, maybe a, a group conversation at your workplace, at your church, whatever it might happen to be. So just, um, this is just a sort of a brief overview of some facilitation skills. So um, I'll, I'll give it with the caveat that, um, you know, having an hour and a half of training is probably not going to have you totally ready to do something like this, but it's a great introduction. And um, there's always people that you can partner up with, including the Mediation Center that can work with you to, to do some facilitations if it's something that you're interested in doing. So, um, and then you can learn the skill while you're doing it, while you're paired with an experienced person. So, a role of a facilitator is a little bit different than say, you know, um, if you are leading a group, say as a teacher or something. So uh, what a facilitator does is really um, helps to follow the conversation and support the conversation, but they're not necessarily in charge of the conversation. Oftentimes um, in a facilitation, it's really not about correct answers, it's about, creating a space where people feel comfortable and safe to talk about whatever it is the, the conversation is about. So it's not really about arriving at correct answers, but just um, having everybody feel comfortable to share their own viewpoints in that conversation. Now, sometimes if you talk to somebody ahead of time, they do have a specific end goal in mind for the facilitation. So, you know, sometimes if it's a workplace, for example, they may say, we wanna come up with three ways to boost morale by the end of this facilitation. So, you know, that, that conversation would have an end goal, but oftentimes there isn't an end goal. It's just convening a group of people to talk about something and to share ideas and to share feelings and to get a pulse on what's been going on with people. So if you're going to be a facilitator, one of the things you want to make sure is um, you decide what your goal is. Is your goal conversation? Is your goal coming up with suggestions? Is your goal deciding an issue? Uh, because that's really going to determine how that facilitation moves forward. And those types of things can all look fairly differently um, in facilitations. As a facilitator, and this can be a difficult one, um, we don't express our personal opinions. We are unbiased. So um, depending on what the topic might be, there may be differing opinions in the room. And it's very important, again, to, um, for people to feel safe that the facilitator doesn't express their personal opinions. Because if they do, that can really shut down people who don't feel similarly. So again, it's perfectly fine to have personal opinions. I myself have many personal opinions, but when I'm facilitating a conversation, that's not the place where I share them. Another thing is that you need to be comfortable with some degree of conflict, especially if you're getting a group of people together that are talking about you know, um, a really powerful or important or emotional issue, there is, going to be probably some degree of uh, conflict, disagreement, maybe some people who get emotional. And as a facilitator, you need to be comfortable with that. You need to be able to 
be there with that in the room and not try to immediately shut it down. Now, of course, you don't want to let the conflict get so out of control that, you know, people are jumping out of their chairs and getting into fistfights. But, um, you know, disagreement is great. That's often how things get resolved is talking through disagreements. So you have to be fairly comfortable with that. And then um, this last one I had on there because um, I was working with a group of teachers who wanted to learn facilitation for their classrooms. So one of the things that I needed to emphasize is when they're acting as a facilitator, they're not a disciplinarian. So uh, it can be very tricky, especially you know, if you're a teacher and you're also facilitating a discussion. So you may wanna think about that ahead of time. If behavior gets out of control, is there somebody in the room that can deal with that? Because as a facilitator, it's not really your job to deal with that. And usually it's the group's job to decide what do we wanna do with this? Um, now, again, in a school, you're a little more constrained by the situation, but it's certainly something to think about because if, if kids are thinking that they may get in trouble for saying certain things, it's really not going to be a good facilitation. So some of the tools that um, facilitators often use, and of course the first one is what we just talked about, reflections and reflective listening. That's really, you know, if you can do that well, you can, you can do so much <laughs> um, because what you're doing as you're, supporting a group's conversation is you're reflecting back what people are saying. So you're letting that person hear what they said to uh, have a chance to clarify it and to make sure they feel heard. And it also lets the other people in the group hear what that person said. Then they can either agree with it or disagree with it. So again, you're using the language that the participants are using. So we're not um, changing words around too much. Um, you know, you can decide ahead of time, you know, depending on who you're dealing with, there, there may be some rough language or cursing in the group. Are you comfortable with that? Um, so that's something you need to think about. And then also matching people's emotional tones. So if somebody's very excited about something in your reflection, you're going to be somewhat excited when you're reflecting it back, right? You're not gonna be flat. <laughs> So um, you, you want to match the emotional tone of what the person is saying. So reflections is the first skill. Another skill that we use a lot is called summaries. And that's sort of when several people have talked, going back and just, just like what it sounds like, summarizing what these people said. So participant A, your, you know, your thoughts on this topic were X, Y, and Z. Participant B, you thought this. And Participant C, you had some, you agreed some with A and some with B. And, you know, as a group, here are the things we talked about and just sort of summarizing the whole thing. And again, in doing that, you're not taking sides. You're just sharing what you've heard. Another useful tool is called check-ins. Um, and that's, again, just what it sounds like. Um, oftentimes, you might get to a point in your facilitation where um, maybe people have just stopped talking or people seem like they're tuning out. So what you might want to just do is, you know, pose a, a check-in question to the group. Seems like you all have gotten kind of quiet. What's going on? Or is this conversation still useful you, for you all? If not, where would you like to take it? Something like that. Just checking in on the process of the facilitation. Um, following or open-ending questions we talked about. So um, again, that would you like to say more about that? That's always a great question for people. Um, and, you know, oftentimes they do want to say more. Sometimes they'll go, no, that's it for now. That's fine. But, um, you know, especially if um, somebody makes a statement that maybe isn't real clear or um, sounds like there may be something more they're wanting to say, that's something you could use. Or again, maybe if there's quiet in the room, you could just say, hey, what are your thoughts about that, you know, um, Jessica? And then Jessica could respond or not. <laughs> and then lastly, silence. Um, really being in the moment with people when they're talking, 
you don't have to have a comment for everything. Um, if you know if somebody is is very emotional, saying something very powerful, just sometimes a pause after they've talked and having some silence to just let what they've said sink in with everybody and let everybody process it is totally fine. So you don't always need to be filling the air. So, and that can be really, really difficult when you're facilitating a group, when it gets quiet, because you feel like I should be doing something. I should be saying something because that silence is so uncomfortable. Um, but typically, if you just sit for a minute, somebody will say something. And then if they don't, again, you could use a, an open-ended question or a check-in. Don't. Any questions or anything about that? I know it's a lot of a lot of skills to cover, and you know we could probably do more than an hour on each of them. But I just wanted to give you an idea about some of the things that we do when we're facilitating group conversations. Yeah, I actually have a question about um, do when we're being reflective listeners. When you read your audience, what what how do you manage or what do you go to if you feel like you're the person you're trying to be a reflective listener to doesn't actually like the reflective listening? Okay. Maybe they would say something like, yes, that's what I said. You don't need to repeat back to me what I'm telling you. Mm -hmm. that, that does occasionally happen. Um, surprisingly, it doesn't happen all that often. Um, but, you know, my my motto is always transparency. So if somebody says, yes, that's what I said, you don't have to repeat it back. Um, you know, what I wouldn't do is reflect that and say, so you don't want me to repeat it back. <laughs> um, but what I would say is, you know, what I'm doing is, is called reflecting. And I do that so that um, I can make sure I'm understanding what you're saying. And, um, and then if it's a group, it's also giving the other participants an, another opportunity to hear what you're saying. And so that's why I do that. And usually that explanation is enough. Um, you know, if somebody really wants to be difficult and tell you not to do that, then I wouldn't do it because, you know, your, your job is not to annoy people. But typically, if somebody does say that, once you explain what you're doing and why, it's usually okay. And um, the more comfortable you are with it, it really doesn't happen all that often because it doesn't sound like you're just parroting back. It sort of sounds like, you know, you're summarizing or you're just, you know, plucking out the main points of what they said and just sort of holding that up for the group. So but that's a good question. Any other questions or comments? Has anybody done, um, well, I know some of you have, um, any group facilitations that, um, you know, they wanted to comment on any of these skills or are there any other things that, that you have found helpful when you're facilitating a group conversation? No? If you think of anything, please feel, oh, I see a hand, Bob. I facilitate a group uh, of um, recovered alcoholics. Mm -hmm. I've been doing that for about, oh, 10 years now. And um, a lot of these points are really helpful to me. And some of them I actually use. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, it, I, I think you're really right on the money. Great. So, which would you mind sharing which which ones that you have used? Um, well, sometimes it, it's for whatever reasons people just don't want to talk, you know. Uh -huh. And there's been some history in our group where when one individual um, sort of had the floor he he had to have the floor if there was silence he couldn't wow. deal with silence and so he would find a way to <laughs> to just dominate uh, the discussion and sometimes I just say you know here we are again it's <laughs> Thursday and uh, it's one o'clock and 
we've been doing this meeting. Some of you have been doing this meeting for over 50 years for crying out loud. So what's up with you? You know, what do you want to talk about? Mm -hmm. That usually gets them going. Yeah, exactly. So instead of, you know, you going up there and saying, okay, we need to talk about this. You're just sort of doing a check-in. What's up with you all? And and the open-ended question, what would you like to talk about? Great. That works well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think one more thing I like to add um, that Bob triggered for me um, is if there's an opportunity to maybe set some ground rules and it comes from the group in terms of how they wanna show up mm-hmm. and interact with one another so that they can self-monitor and self-check themselves so that when you use that check-in, you can kind of relate back to what they agreed in terms of how they want to show and show up and be with one another. Absolutely. I, have you been looking ahead at my slides? Because there's a, there's a slide coming up where we talk about ground rules. <laughs> So um, so in terms of, of setting the tone when you're a facilitator, you know, you want to set a conversational tone as opposed to, say, a preachy tone or a teaching tone or any other kind of, you know, tones that you might take when you're in front of a group. Um, and actually, oftentimes when you're facilitating, you're not in front of the group. You're in a circle or something like that. And the facilitator is a part of the circle. So um, you want to allow your participants as many choices as possible about what they want to talk about, how they want to talk about it, things like that. Um, You're going to mostly follow and honor where they are. So, you know, you may think that by the end of the conversation, um, they will have resolved whatever issue is on the table, perhaps. And perhaps that's not where they're going. And perhaps there's just a lot to talk about and people have a lot of feelings to express and that's what they wanna stay with and that's what's helpful for them. So as a facilitator, we sort of need to leave our own agenda aside. Um, And again, that's where um, before you go into the facilitation, you wanna think about, okay, what is the purpose of this facilitation? Do, you know, is somebody asking me to get to an answer in which case there is an end goal or is this just a conversation and we want to see where it goes? So it's important to think about that beforehand. And then another thing is that facilitators really aren't part of the conversation. Our job is to follow the conversation of the participants. So occasionally we might throw in, you know, an anecdote or, you know, we, we can do things to, to help keep the conversation moving or on track, but what we don't want to do is draw the focus to ourselves as facilitators. The conversation belongs to the group and we're there to support that conversation. So there are some folks that are just naturally very charismatic, that have great stories, that are great to listen to. Um, But as a facilitator, we want to try not to do that too much because then the group is sort of looking to you as the leader. Uh, or as the storyteller, or whatever it is, and it's no longer their conversation. It's you're running the show. So that's something to be careful of. So I'm just going to go briefly over some of these things. Um, You know, we have 10 actions that can shut down conversations. So these are things you just want to be cognizant of when you're going into um, facilitating a conversation. So the first and probably the most important is the facilitator needs to have fun. Um, If you're not having fun, if you're looking stiff, you're looking nervous, you're looking miserable, you're not going to facilitate a good conversation. Um, It's of course natural to be nervous, especially when you've not done it before or it's a very high stakes situation. Um, My best advice is fake it. Just act like you're not nervous and pretty soon you won't be. Um, But if you look like you're all nerves, if you're reading from notes constantly, if you're stiff, that doesn't facilitate good conversation. Um, You also don't wanna be friendlier to some people than you are to other people. 
So you, you may know some of the participants, but you don't wanna spend 15 minutes before the conversation talking with one person and then having that person be a part of the group. Um, and we talked about before, your role is to support, it's not to be a teacher, the conversation belongs to the group. Um, it can also shut down conversation if you as the facilitator are making all the decisions as to how the people will have the conversation, including setting the group guidelines for them. Okay, when we talk about guidelines, we'll talk about how to involve the group in setting those guidelines for themselves. And you don't want to advocate for certain ideas or certain people. Again, you want to make sure you're neutral. Again, um, if, you're, if there's conflict in the room and you're avoiding it or you're ignoring it, um, it's only going to escalate and it's going to derail your facilitation. Um, obviously, you don't want to be judgmental. You don't want to allow a few people to dominate the conversation. Um, as I said before, you don't want to put in your opinions and personal stories. And you know, if a facilitator doesn't demonstrate good listening skills, obviously they're, they're not going to be facilitating well. Okay. So let's talk about the things that you want to do that will support a good conversation. So the first is creating that safe space for people. And just setting that relaxed conversational tone, the non-judgmental atmosphere really can help. Um, oftentimes people come into these things not knowing what to expect. And so by being relaxed, being friendly, just setting that nice tone, it really helps people relax and that can help them have a good conversation. So you, again, you wanna support conversation rather than lead the discussion to the direction that you want it to go. Um, for those of you who like to be in control and I'm one of them, um, you need to let go of that need for control when you're facilitating. You really have to trust the participants to decide for themselves what's important to talk about and how they wanna talk about it and maximize opportunities for people to have choice avoid taking sides, comfortable with conflict. Um, you wanna remain calm in conflict, conflict happens. Um, and sometimes some of the best conversations can happen around conflict. So you wanna acknowledge it and deal with it. Um, but if you, if, like we said before, if you avoid it, you ignore it, it's just going to escalate. Um, an important thing for a facilitator to do is not just um, talk about areas where people agree, but also highlight where people disagree. So that can be very important as well, and it can help really clarify things for people. You want to interact with people in a balanced manner, make sure everybody has an opportunity to be heard. Some people um, are not talkers. They're not comfortable talking in groups. You want to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to talk but you certainly don't wanna force it. So, you know, if somebody hasn't been talking, you could say, hey, we haven't heard from you. Megan, would you, would you like to chime in? And Megan could say, sure, and say something, or she could go, no, I'm good, and that's fine. So you just wanna open up the space for them, but not force it. And again, you're gonna use your reflective listening skills. So guidelines. And so I like to call them guidelines rather than rules, um, just because again, rules comes across as kind of uh, authoritarian. So I talk about group guidelines for a discussion. These are the ones actually that I use with, um, I do some classroom facilitations. So these are the guidelines that I use for my fifth graders. Um, when you're doing, when you're facilitating a group, um, it can help if you have one or two guidelines that that are important to you and you can share those with the group. And then you wanna try and get the group to come up with some guidelines that they would like to have for this conversation. So one of the ones I use with my kids is speak from the heart, listen with respect. Um, I like to tell them to share the air because again, there are some kids that will talk and talk and talk and not stop. So I can remind them, you know, our guideline of sharing the air, that can be helpful with adults as well, if you have some people that really like to dominate. 
the group can have a conversation about whether or not they want what's said in the facilitation to be confidential or not. Um, some groups may not care. Some groups, it may be very important to talk about confidentiality. Again, it really depends on the topics that you're talking about and who your group is. Um, it's okay to pass if you don't have something to say. And then I always leave it open. Um, if there are other guidelines that people want to have. Sometimes the groups will really want a lot of guidelines. Um, other times it, it's pretty, pretty flexible. So um, Loletta, you had mentioned guidelines. Are there any ones that, that you like to use or find helpful when you're facilitating groups? Um, again, I think what's important is leaving it open for them <laughs> to share what they think they need in order to show up because they tend to commit to them more. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that's why you want to have that conversation very early on about what are your group guidelines going to be. I even, um, you know, if I'm doing a PowerPoint like this, I'll have them up. If we're in person, I usually have them, I write them on a chart so that everybody can see them. So that way, if some, you know, if people are going outside of the guidelines, it's very easy to say, hey, remember back at the beginning of this conversation, we set these guidelines and to remind people. Um, and that's a lot easier and, and comes across as less disciplinarian because the group has decided what they want their guidelines to be. All right, so I'm going to turn it over to Jessica for a little bit to um, tell you a little bit about some community conversations called living room conversations. Yeah, thank you. So we're moving into the resource sharing piece now. And the organization that I work for, Peace Through Action, which you know, um, we're part of the National Bridge Building Movement. And I found out about Living Room Conversations through the Listen First Coalition. And actually, Sherry, could you please put that slide back up? Oh, sure. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see what their mission statement is right there. and. Their website is full of toolkits, conversation guides, and resources on how to join a conversation that has already been organized, or you can choose to host a conversation of your own. So if you want to host a conversation, they have a document that outlines how to do that with step-by-step -step instructions, along with best practices. And what's really great about this initiative is that they have over 100 topics that are ready to discuss, and each topic has targeted questions for your group to answer. So some example topics by category include things like education, the environment, justice, um, politics and governance, or even war and peace. So they have so they have over 100 topics. And like I said, they're organized by category. Um, once you choose the topic that you're interested in talking about, you then will decide on the date and the location, you know, whether it be in, in an actual living room or maybe at your favorite coffee shop or um, even online over Zoom. Um, so I thought that I could share an example. Okay, now you can stop sharing, uh, Sherry. Sure. Yeah. I can share an example of a conversation guide that you could use if you chose to do one of these. Okay, so obviously I chose the peace building in the United States as the, as the topic. Um, this is what I just downloaded it from their website. This is an example conversation guide. It breaks up the conversation into sections. So it shows you, you start out with the introductions, explain why you're here. It'll take you about 10 minutes. They tell you what you can talk about in, in, in order to introduce yourself. Then you move into the conversation agreements, which Sherry mentioned as well. Um, so you'll really set the standard for how you'll engage together. Then you go down to question three, which is the rounds of questions. So round one, you get to know each other by asking the questions that they have here. And that's really just to learn more about the group. And then round two, you explore the topic at hand. So in this case, it's peace building in the United States. So you would read this paragraph together and then answer the questions that they have regarding the paragraph. And 
this would be the bulk of the conversation. It says it'll take about 40 minutes. Um, but yeah, everything is all laid out here. And then round three is reflecting on the conversation that you just had. And they have the converse, they have the questions right here for your reflection. And then you wrap up and you do a short closing. Um, but yeah, like I said, they have over a hundred topics um, ready to discuss. So really you just have to organize it if you wanna bring people together. And yeah, I think it's a really great opportunity for people to get involved and you know, lead community conversations and have more meaningful conversations in your life. So I hope that's helpful. And yeah, that's all I wanted to share about that. So I'll pass it back to Sherry. Alrighty. Okay, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but um, I, I thought, you know, as we were talking about facilitation, some people might have um, some questions about, well, what if, what if? Um, so these are some common what ifs that can happen when you're facilitating a conversation. So um, sometimes the group can just come to an impasse. Um, they stop talking, get quiet, things aren't moving forward. So if that happens, again, think about um, the slide where I laid out the uh, facilitator's toolkit and those different things that you can do. So one of the things you can do if there's an impasse is, and I think Bob even talked about this, checking in with people. Hey, what's going on right now? Um, you know, wh what happened? Uh, suddenly people got quiet and where do you wanna go from here? An open-ended question. So that's a great way to deal with an impasse. Getting sidetracked, um, that can happen. Again, uh, depending on what your group guidelines are, you can always refer back to that. Um, and it also depends on, you know, if it's a sidetrack that seems like it's on everybody's mind and it's really important, then perhaps that's where the group needs to go. If it's one person that's just sort of on a wild tangent that the rest of the group is not really involved in, then it may be important to kind of bring that person back to the topic that at hand. So again, it really depends on um, whether it's one person getting sidetracked or whether it really seems to be something that's important for the group to talk about. And if it is, you may just wanna be able to go there. Interruptions is something that the group might want to deal with beforehand in the guidelines. So people can talk about, do we want to take turns? Um, sometimes in a, in a facilitated conversation, you may even have a talking piece that people pass around the circle and you talk when you have the talking piece. Other times, you know, you might say, hey, you know, whoever wants to talk can just call out. Um, so you can talk about, the group can decide how they want to deal with interruptions. The discussion hog, um, again, it's important to go back to those guidelines. Um, if you set up for, you know, talking as well as listening, um, like I like to use with the kids, share the air. Um, it's something that you can remind people of. Um, and as a facilitator, you can just sort of, when, when they take a breath, you know, hey, it was great hearing from you. I wonder if anybody else would like to comment on that as well and just kind of try and take that conversation to somebody else. So again, you know, as a facilitator, you don't want to be a disciplinarian. You don't want to be telling people you're hogging the conversation, let somebody else have a turn. Um, so, but sort of, you know, in a gentle way, direct the conversation to somebody else. Um, the critic, actually, that was one that uh, you talked about, you know, the person who doesn't like being, being reflected, um, that's fine. And again, you know, part of being a facilitator is really um, leaving your ego out of it and letting the group decide what they want to do. So, you know, um, like I said, I'm very transparent about what I do and why. And if people, if the group doesn't like the way that's going, they can talk about how they want it to go, what they would prefer. And we'll go with that. That's fine. People not participating. Again, you want to make space for maybe your quieter members to participate. So if it's been a while and you haven't heard from somebody, you may wanna purposely say, you know, hey, Jessica, you've been kind of quiet. Did you have something to share here? 
um, and give them the opportunity to do that because some people are not ju comfortable just jumping into a conversation. But again, you don't want to force participation. Some people get a lot out of just listening and you know that can be fine. And lastly, if conflict erupts, that's okay. Um, you want to hold up that disagreement and talk about it. And that can be a really fruitful part of a conversation. So again, don't, don't be afraid of conflict. So I know that's a, you know, a real quick overview, but there are ways to deal with any kind of problem that could crop up in a facilitation. And uh, surprisingly for me, they, they normally don't. Um, people usually are, um, extend you a lot of grace. And, um, you know, if they're there, they're there because they want to be there for the most part and will participate to the degree that they're comfortable. So a lot of these things really never come up, but it's always good to think about just to be prepared. So that's bringing us to the end of our um, conversation tonight. So we had um, a few upcoming events that we wanted to share with the group. So I can talk about the first one and then I'll turn it back over to Jessica. Um, the Mediation Center is looking to train some new community mediators. Um, what that involves is a 40 hour basic mediation training. The first 30 hours of this are going to be held the first two weekends of June. So it'll be Friday evening from like five to eight or six to nine then all day Saturday and Sunday, and then repeating it the following weekend. And then we'll have a few more hours of training after that at some later date. Um, it is a, an online training. Um, when we scheduled it, we still didn't know what the pandemic was going to be doing. So we thought to be <laughs> better play it safe. So it's an online training. You don't need any kind of educational or work background to be a community mediator, just an interest in supporting people and resolving their conflicts. We provide you all the training. We provide you the supervision. We provide you continuing education um, and opportunities to help out in your community. So if anybody is interested in that, please feel free to contact me. I can send you more information and I can send you an application. Um, please contact me sooner rather than later because the dates are creeping up on us. Um, the Mediation Center is also looking for board members. If anybody is, if uh, being on a board is your jam, we're looking for a couple more new board members. So uh, again, contact me for any or all of that. Um, and feel free to contact me if uh, you're wanting to resolve a conflict through mediation or have some kind of facilitation. We're there to support you with that as well. So, Jessica, I'll turn it over to you for the next one. Sure. So the Calvert Library System hosted um, productive community conversation back in April at Moley's, and they are going to have a follow up session um, sometime in the fall. The date isn't determined yet, but um, we will definitely be letting you know on our newsletter and also on the on the library system. They they have the they will have it on their on their newsletter as well or on their website. So stay tuned for that. And um, we were partnered with the library system, with the mediation center, with the big conversation and the Democrats and the Republicans in Calvert. And I'm sure it'll be the same moving forward. So stay tuned. Um, all right, so I think that's the end of our event. So thank you so much, Sherry, for facilitating this training and also for the work that you're doing in the world. And thank you to everyone for um, participating tonight. I will send a follow-up email later this week that will include a post-event survey that I would greatly appreciate if you completed. I will also include the PowerPoint slides and other resources related to this evening's topic. So thank you all and have a great night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.